Well, good evening. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We are small but mighty. Um, so this is our second collab talk, and today's conversation is going to be focusing on technology and creativity. So collab talks, these are a new monthly discussion series produced by the staff here in the collab, and it's taking a look at what is exciting, new, and complicated in our high tech world. They are the first Thursday of each month from four to five o'clock here in the collab. We couldn't do these events without our expert panel. And so uh, we'll introduce them here shortly. The way this is gonna work is that first, uh, we are going to watch a short YouTube video that is gonna basically provide some shared um, food for thought for us to have for our conversation tonight. Um, our expert panel is here to, basically they're, gonna, they're experts in um, different areas related to our topic, and so they're here to add depth to our conversation. Um, our first uh, member of the guest panel is Professor Russ Hanna. Professor Hanna has been involved in teaching computer science and technology at JCCC for 27 years. His interests include virtual reality, augmented reality, motion capture, video game technology, and artificial intelligence. He is the founder and current chair of the game development program here at JCCC. His current projects include establishing an esports program at the college and researching methods for creating more realistic artificial intelligence in games. Professor Handa earned both his bachelor's and master's degrees from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. And Professor Handa is here in the back. Our panel will take, the, will take their chairs here once we get past the uh, TED talk. Second on our panel this evening is Professor Tanya Hughes, uh, here in the second row. Uh, Tanya Hughes is a socially, politically driven visual artist working in the influential mediums of photography, video, and installation. While the majority of her work is rooted in political, feminist, and queer theory discourse, it also continues to express a broad range of topical and academic research. Hughes grew up in the southeastern region of the United States and graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree from Columbus State University. In 2008, she completed her MFA in photography and video at Georgia State University. Hughes taught photography, digital arts, women's gender and sexuality studies as a senior lecturer at Georgia Southwestern State University from 2009 to 2016. In addition to her creations in the visual arts, Hughes continues research in women's gender and sexuality studies and has completed a graduate certificate in the field from Georgia State University in 2016. In 2016, she accepted a teaching position here at Johnson County Community College, where she now serves as assistant professor of filmmaking and photography. Our third guest is Mr. Mika Klein, sitting here in the third row. Uh, Mika Klein is a product and user experience designer for Greg Advertising. He earned his first Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design from Marshall University, where he focused on typography and logo design before attending the Kansas City Art Institute to complete a BFA in illustration with an emphasis in vector motion graphics. His goal with studying two vastly different fields is to create a perfect union between traditional arts and digital design without sacrificing usability. During the final year of his illustration degree, he began to teach himself basic coding and found a truly rewarding passion for web design and development. After graduating from KCAI, Mika served as art director and user experience designer for Black Dog Advertising, and then as creative director and user experience designer for an e-commerce startup both in Florida. He recently returned to the Kansas City area to assume, his, to assume his current role with Greg Advertising, where he continues to work to change the face of design. And finally, Colin Mosley. Colin is a new media artist and interdisciplinary researcher who uses animation, 3D modeling, and programming to create interactive art. He is the co-founder of Robot Rauschenberg. Am I close, Colin? Okay. Uh, a new media collective working to bring together traditional and technological art forms in performative and material ways. RR has exhibited, performed, and presented workshops nationally at Comfort Station, Salonathon, and the MCA. Mosley received his BFA from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and is currently an MA candidate at the University of Missouri, Kansas City with a focus in video art and new media studies. His art practice focuses on the non-human human dialogue, in specific how plant life relates to human and technological innovations. And then our thought leader for this evening is Dr. Sergei Mokhov. He is an affiliate assistant professor of computing science and software engineering at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec. Um, so we would likely refer to him as an adjunct faculty member here in the States. 
Um, he's currently working on developing curriculum related to enter, uh, entertainment technology, but that is not actually his original background. Um, his bachelor's uh, and master's degrees, all from Concordia, are in computer science and engineering, and his PhD is also in computer science. As you'll learn as we look at the TED talk that he does, he kind of came into doing work uh, artistically, almost accidentally, as part of a collaboration request, um, but bringing that technological expertise and connecting it to an artistic expression. So we will go ahead and t uh, start with our TED talk. So as a uh, former theater and performance artist, I'm already having all kinds every time I watch this, I say all kind of cool things that you could potentially do uh, with a live performance piece, um, incorporating this kind of technology. And suddenly my clicker has stopped working. There we go. So but before we get into um, our, our formal uh, questions that we've prepared for this, I'd like to invite our guest panel to come up and, and take their seats um, and then start with first with our audience and then we'll go to the expert guest panel. But first, just any impressions or thoughts or things that you thought of as uh, a result of watching our video today? Maybe we'll start with the expert panel. <laughs> um, uh, Colin, you've got the um, microphone nearest you there, if you could just turn that on for you. While they're doing that, can we do this at our school? Can we do these things? Um, so actually, I'm going to start then with Professor Hanna, because <laughs> he could speak to that. Um, yes, we can. Um, let me back up a little bit, and I'll let, add some more to that. Um, what you're seeing right there is a combination of several things that have actually been around quite a while. Um, he's not doing so much motion capture. What he's doing is edge detection on images. So he's taking a single camera, um, looking at an image that's 2D, and then doing computer processing on it to figure out where the edges of objects are in there and extracting those objects, which is a very difficult mathematical problem, actually. If you watch the video, you'll notice that um, the actors are moving ahead of the images quite a bit. And that's because it takes that long for the computer to figure out what the people are doing. And I know it also looks kind of artistic on there, but when it loses parts of the body and the heads disappear, that's a flaw in the algorithm. That's not a, it comes out looking cool, but that's, that probably wasn't intentional. But uh, we can actually track in three dimensions, truly three dimensions here, like in our mocap studio. So yeah, we could do that. Thank you, Professor Hanna. I think uh, he mentions a, a Re references an important point that was talked about a little bit in the video, though, is, is that as soon as we start adding in these new tools and pieces uh, to a uh, performance or another uh, creative work, um, it becomes complicated um, and may add you know, unintended effects, um, kind of like what we saw there that was still cool, but maybe wasn't what they originally intended. And so it adds a lot of level of complication as soon as we start adding these pieces uh, to a piece. Uh, any other members of our panel who'd like to give some thoughts on the video? So my favorite part about this was um, the discussion about how collaborative it was. So I love collaborations, so we can come play when you come. <laughs> so in, um, and I think it's really interesting to consider dance and performance while also using technology and filming and like putting everything together. And I think it, it adds a whole new dimension of what the possibilities could be. So I got really excited about that. Thank you. Uh, Mika, Colin, any thoughts? Yeah, um, kind of mentioning the collaboration there. Uh, when you're in school, you don't really think about how anybody outside of your own projects, but um, in the field, you're definitely having to incorporate music and motion and programmers and just completely collaborative. Um, and there's a, a bit of spontaneity in that the algorithms don't really work, as you mentioned. Um, and so every performance is a single one of a kind because you're never going to get that that mistake again. So um, mm -hmm. in that respect, every performance is going to be different each time. So, uh, Yeah, I would just like to add what to what Russ was saying, um, sort of about the technology side of it is uh, actually really early on, um, a lot of people were doing this work in sort of performative uh, motion capture or whatever you want to call it. Um, utilize the Xbox Connect. It's kind of become less and less used within this, but very early on when people started to sort of uh, d dwell into it, um, people had Xboxes, people had an Xbox Connect, and then uh, just, you know, uh, working with that through a PC, they're able to uh, start making um, performative stuff like this. 
And and I just like to add to the collaboration part too. Like, it's very very important. But not only um, that it's happening, but in the way that it's happening, that they both are informing each other because the technology side of it, the computer side of it. Um, as an artist or as uh, the engineer, uh, really as the artist, a lot of the times you're, you have to give a little bit of the control over to the technology because sometimes it doesn't always do what you expected. Um, and then in particular for performances, it's not always gonna act the same way. So when those things are forming simultaneously at the same time, when the, the dancers are working with the software engineers and the software engineers and um, computer science, uh, scientists are working with the artists, that's when you have the best result because um, you're not making a program that's then going to be uh, not interact in a, a, a way that you expect because the artist also has to be aware of the technology. The dancer has to be aware of how their movements are affecting that. So you could see a number of different effects in the video and depending on how they were moving, um, I'm sure you know if if their movements more more erratic, uh, you know you would have different effects. So that fluidity of that was was very important. And I think it's interesting you mentioned too the the point that um, in order to um, by expanding possibilities and having more uh, things that we can do with this technology, it also means giving up some control. So it's a give and take, right, as part of this process. Um, specifically talking about the collaborative piece, and Mika, I wonder if you could respond to this, being trained as a traditional artist and then going into a more applied field, learning how to collaborate with folks who aren't trained as artists. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience is like? Um, at the beginning, it's definitely painful. Um, you are definitely restricted to, like Colin said, the technology sometimes. Um, any kind of micro interactions you might visualize or think about, somewhere, someday, somebody can create it. But um, sometimes the technology just isn't there yet. And um, you have to kind of lean into the expertise of those that you're collaborating with sometimes. Um, sometimes they will have something you didn't even think of. and. Uh, it ends up making a, a product that's better, but um, completely different than what you visualized. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a really interesting outcome, but it, it, it's, a, again, you're giving up control and having to be more collaborative. Um, I wonder if Russ or, or Tanya has any uh, commentary on, um, particularly Russ being trained in the computer science side of then learning how to work with, um, you know, quote unquote, creatives or, or artists and figure out how to bridge that gap. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. There's a couple of comments. Uh, you mentioned getting something that you didn't expect at the end. So in video game development, which is why I'm, where I'm at right now, that's where you always end up. Uh, you start here, you think you're going here, you end up over here, right? And that's because of exactly what you described, that you run into problems you didn't expect, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I'm going to reverse what you just said. It's very painful for technical people to work with artists, too, <laughs> right? So um, we have formal methodologies to actually deal with that. And he mentions them in the video, the agile methodologies. And that's how you take something that uh, is changing on you all the time, or you're not sure where you're going. And it, it's, a, it's a software methodology that's actually used throughout even the artwork and all that to, um, to make sure you don't, it doesn't get out of hand. So we've, we've been pulled in that agile methodology and, uh, into the game development process. So uh, that's, that's the key, communication in a language everybody understands, mm -hmm. right? You don't, I don't speak and programmers speak to artists. They don't speak and artists speak to me. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we find a different way to talk, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Finding a shared language that, that makes sense for the yeah. project. And yeah, that and that's part of the agile, how to, how, to, how to say things so people understand what you're saying. Okay, yep. that makes sense, thank you. Um, and I think that's generally, um, particularly for our students who um, are thinking about their professional lives, almost every profession has its own lingo. Um, that you learn, and I think that's one of the challenges is figuring out how to get outside of your own silo so that you don't get confined by that language, that it continues to be a means of, of communication as opposed to a means of breaking you off from other people. Um, before we jump into our formal questions, uh, any other, now that we've had kind of talked a little bit and you've had a little bit more time to think, anybody in the audience with anything that they would like to uh, comment on or, or give feedback on before we move on to the next slide? Yeah. This just, um, keeps sticking with me every every time I think about it in that video. I can't believe that he didn't think about cable length until six hours before the performance. <laughs> right. That's so. Yeah. That those practical limitations. But I think it's an interesting. Um, 
example of folks who maybe aren't used to working in a particular venue or format, suddenly all the problems that somebody who maybe is used to live performance or has done that before go, well, of course we need X number of feet of cable. Um, so yeah, I think that's one of those communication challenges of learning how to translate each other's space. So that's a good comment. Anybody else have anything they would like to share? Oh, I've got back, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Vince. I like the flaw part because the flaw brings out the humanity and you know, it's really what makes it art. And bring, having that technology, that uh, algorithm that doesn't pick up every single movement brings in the hum human part of the art, I think. It, you'd be surprised how often what people praise in video games was a mistake. Yeah. That's true of everybody, all art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Tony, did you have something you wanted to go oh, off of that? No, I was just saying, I think that's true of all art. <laughs> That all art is kind of a, a process of discovery? Mistakes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go into some kind of our, our guided questions here. So in watching this video, this got me to thinking again, I have a, a background as a performance artist, um, and I remember uh, when I was working in that field, we were really excited when we could incorporate like PowerPoint. Um, we're like, oh my gosh, we can't afford scenery. We'll just print a picture up. So that was revolutionary at the time. But watching this made me think about, okay, what else might we do if we were remounting some of those performances now? Um, how, how would that performance that we were so excited with PowerPoint when we did it 10, 15 years ago, okay, well, what might we be excited about now? So I kind of want to pose this question both to our panel and to the audience here of think about um, your favorite film, TV show, uh, theater production, artwork, any creative work that you're particularly passionate about. Um, how might it look different if it was created 10 years later? How, or if it was created 10 years earlier. How does the time and place and the technology that's available impact uh, the nature of the creative work that we see? So for example, I brought up here Rebecca Sugar, because um, she's the creator of one of my favorite TV shows right now, Steven Universe, um, that folks may be f uh, familiar with. I include her here for a couple of reasons. Um, so the TV show that she is a showrunner of right now, if it had been created, let's say, 10 years ago, um, content would have been very different. First of all, she's the first female showrunner for Cartoon Network, so it likely would have been run by a man. Um, the content of the show would have been different, uh, would not likely have dealt with like queer characters, for example. Um, and, uh, but also not just the content would be different, but the way that the show was produced would have been different 10 years ago. Uh, the show is released in what they call Stephen Bombs, as opposed to traditional um, seasons, because it helps create uh, social media hype. Um, so thinking about not just um, how the medium, like the particular medium you're working in changes, but also how you promote it, how you connect with other folks, how you make your work sustainable. So um, again, so the, what the kind of work that she, that she has done um, would have looked vastly different. In fact, she probably would have had a much harder time doing it 10 years ago. Um, so I wonder if anybody else has I, thoughts about other work or things that might, how, how they might look different um, if we rolled forward 10 years or rolled back. Well, when I, he shared these questions ahead of time. So the first, when I looked at these to begin with, my first thing was I was thinking, I love Game of Thrones. It's like um, my brain candy. And I was thinking about dragons and went back and looked at the different kind of portrayals of dragons over the years. But even more interesting um, we, than perhaps looking at dragons, um, before this, we were all standing around and talking about technology. And um, I was thinking about Tupac and the whole like hologram and how drastically they that's changed so much about industry so now you have um for those of you who aren't familiar tupac was recreated as a hologram and performed in a concert um so now you have situations where um actors are having it built into their contract as to whether or not they can be scanned so in case they die the production can go forward um, there's also, for musicians and people that are famous, they're putting it in their will as to whether or not they'll allow that. So if they die, you know, you can't, maybe you can bring back Stevie Nicks. I don't know, maybe not. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing to think about. And then we were talking, too, about um, how does that work in terms of pay? So do you want to like, talk? It's like he was showing me about gaming imagery, and we were curious about, you know, when you, somebody, an actor's, images used in a game, you know, how does, how does that work out in their contract? So all of that, I think, because of technology, the whole industry is changing down to probably lawyers and accountants and mm -hmm. <laughs> everything mm -hmm. to try and figure out how do you charge for something that may happen later, mm -hmm. your identity mm -hmm. continue to be used. Mm -hmm. So that and dragons. <laughs> <laughs> 
Other thoughts? <laughs> and actually, uh, Mika, before you jump in, I think um, that um, Professor Hughes makes a good point in that even the way that people, we, as you think about um, how you're going to make a living in these fields um, and thinking about the contract implications, um, that's changing as a result of technology. Um, I also think of the technology that was used to um, allow a young um, Carrie Fisher uh, to show up in uh, the most recent Star Wars film, um, and I'm forgetting the name of the actor who played um, one of the villains in that, but both of them, both of those actors had passed, um, Carrie just right before, um, so, but they were able to recreate, and we had um, one character who appeared, appeared throughout the entire movie, and that actor had been dead for 30 years. Um, so, really creating your work now lives on beyond you in some interesting ways now that it wasn't possible before. So. As a side note, um, Bojack actually makes fun of this very topic, um, having <laughs> scanned in the main character and then just completely replacing him in his movie. So uh, <laughs> that's possible in the future, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of my, f my field as a product designer, we have to start thinking about um, things like voice, voice design, um, the way that you talk to your phone and interact with apps and things like that. So um, our process is ever evolving and um, all visual forms of art, I think, are, are visually evolving. Um, I don't even know if there was a question. I just kind of <laughs> rambled off there for a second, but. Uh, well, but so it sounds like, so as technology is evolving, you're having to incorporate new inputs that you haven't thought about before. So again, that voice interactivity, um, and also changing expectations of your audience of the way they expect to be able to access your content, engage with it, um, pose feedback, that kind of stuff. So all of that is changing the way that both artists have to create content, but that you in a commercial space are also thinking about, okay, how about my clients, what are their needs, and how are those evolving? Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and speaking kind of like of that agile, I work from a lean experience, which is kind of a form of agile. Um, there's this ever A-B testing phase that you do. So you create a concept, um, test it with live people, and then make adjustments based off of that. And it's just a continuous loop. Um, you're constantly trying to optimize failing uh, a lot of the time, and then making adjustments based off of those failures to make it better. Um, with the introduction of voice design or um, you know, some kind of touch sensors or even AR, um, you're often having to test two different fields um, or even more than that. So whereas, um, a website may have one direct way that you move through it. Uh, now incorporating voice, you have to think of how is the person going to navigate through my website if they're just using voice versus if they're click through. Um, so there's multiple ways that we have to start um, planning out the way that we develop anything these mm days. -hmm. And Colin, did you have anything you wanted to? Yeah, sure. Um I, that was very interesting hearing uh, uh, about the voice thing because I'm always angry with Siri. But um, <laughs> <laughs> also uh, that in a way of uh, an extension um, of your voice. And as a visual artist, like looking at using technology in uh, interactive, performative ways, um, Susan Kozel is another um, artist. She is a choreographer and a dancer who uses technology within her her dance work. But um, she mentions uh, two different th uh, things that I think are, are, are really interesting um, when it comes to technology and interactivity is that it allows for these extensions to happen. Um, one being an extension of your senses. So uh, you may be able to hear or see something that you weren't able to before um, without this technology. Uh, and the second one is extending uh, our relationship with others around us. So our connectedness. So you know, you look at Twitter and how it's affected uh, the current political landscape and just everything. Um, uh, it's interesting to look to those two ideas and think like, what what's a positive uh, uh, interaction, or what's what's a positive thing that can happen out of this uh, extended senses or these extended uh, uh, relationships with others? Um, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So not just how um, your audience uh, maybe is trying to interact with you, but how what are ways that we can interact with our audience in a different way, and how can people interact with each other? Yeah, and how they how. You know, I guess going from a, a visual way of like how you look at things, how you perceive it. You know, when you're looking at artwork, you know, it's all about your perception or your, uh, you know, how 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 you see it. And and um, 
because I'm always looking at, uh, personally in my own art, I'm always looking at nature. So I'm always thinking about, well, how can uh, we see this or hear this in a way that we can't, um, so we can have this sort of connection with it. Thank you. Other com uh, any other comments before we move on to our next? Okay. So for our next question is we look for, continue to look ahead now um, to the future of content creation, distribution, and consumption. Um, content creation, hosting, and sharing is increasingly diversified. So there's all these different platforms and formats, right, that we encounter and engage with creative content. Um, what are some of the implications, though, for uh, both content creators and for consumers in just this mass diversification of all of these platforms and outlets? Um, you know, from a uh, learning standpoint, there's been a lot of concern, um, for example, in that as we've diversified outlets for information, for example, that it becomes easier for folks to kind of put blinders on and focus only on the information that they choose to engage with. Mm -hmm. And so thinking of that in a creative context, uh, the kind of the uh, creative content that people are going to engage with, I'm curious if our audience or if our expert panel has any thoughts on um, what this broadening, uh, you know, it's democratized uh, distribution in a lot of ways. It's easier to, to dist distribute content in some ways, but it's also a lot harder to be heard at this point. So I'd be interested if anybody has thoughts on, on that element of, of technological change. <laughs> um, well, in some ways, we've kind of created a paradigm for ourselves um, in that how do we distribute content without Facebook or Instagram anymore? Um, it, it almost seems impossible. And uh, 20 or 10 years ago, um, creating something like an album cover art for something, how do you promote that? You, do you reach out direct mail? Um, do you post it? somewhere on a, a notification board. Um, so now that we've kind of created this paradigm for ourselves, we've got things in terms of usage rights that we have to think about um, when, whenever, whenever we post our stuff somewhere or if we're reaching out to an outside agency. How, what are the, the benefits to that as well as the negatives? Um, and it's, it's hard to tell now that we're in this paradigm to think outside of it because um, we're kind of limited to what we now know and what's now new. Um, if that kind of answers the question or not. Yeah, absolutely it does. Um, and I, I um, had a thought and it's lost me now, so the wonder of live performance, right? Um, do we have any other comments from our expert panel while I try to retrieve my, <laughs> my, my own thoughts? So we're kind of echoing which, what both of you are saying, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's good is that it used to, especially for visual artists, you had to wait for a gallery owner or curator to go, oh, yeah, I've seen that work. I like it. Let's show it. And now you don't have to wait anymore. You make your website or you put it up on YouTube. Um, and it, there are galleries that are even totally online now which is making it easier to be shown in some ways. But then the flip side of that is there is so much that mm -hmm. it's really hard to, to be, like you said, it's hard to get past the noise, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of people looking in, in terms of being an artist trying to show. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. It's hard both ways. And I think um, photographers in particular have taken a huge hit, um, you know, in, in terms of careers. Mm -hmm. Used to people hired staff photographers. And now with stock imagery, there are fewer and fewer jobs because of that. Um, so I think that, you know, you have am more amateur photographers who can put images up on stock. But it's hard. It's in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And it's um, been interesting to watch the economics of this diversification and in a way that it has actually kind of devalued formerly trained artists. Um, now that amateurs have access to a lot of the same distribution channels, it's, it's, uh, I think that's added some interesting challenges to that. Um, I do remember my comment now and wanted to ask the group, um, so I think Mika made a, a good reference to this. So we think about like our distribution channels um, like uh, Facebook or Twitter, um, but they're fundamentally different than like, um, you know, your public access, public access cable channel or something, right? They are large corporate entities with their own agendas, their own rules. Um, and so it's added, I think of the collaboration piece we were just talking about, if you now have another collaborator 
uh, that you have to think about in your process. Whether you really want to be collaborating with them or not, you have to think about what are their rules, what are their channels, and whether or not I'm going to, uh, you know, is this a good fit for my content? Uh, a new piece that maybe uh, has not been something artists have had to think about before. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are also new interesting jobs being created because of this whole thing, too. Um, I, one of my friends, Sheila Pre Bright, she actually has um, these kind of this entourage that go around with her to help her um, with her brand. And she's an artist, but like coaching her about brand and making sure that everything gets out on those like social media things as she's doing them. Mm. So she doesn't have to do it. She hires somebody to do it that's proving, I guess, advantageous in helping her get work out there. So. Interesting. So she's collaborating with her own production team in a way that helps mm -hmm. him manage all the new pieces that are right. interesting. So that's kind of diversifying who we collaborate with. Mm -hmm. yeah. In advertising, we're constantly working with um, influencers, as they're called. So we're reaching out to social media platforms to see who's got the most followers. Um, and then they promote specific content that we push to them. And they get something out of it, maybe a discount for product or a free product. And then they can promote it that way. Um, and micro-influencers we like specifically because they're small following. And then they just kind of boom into a large following. Um, and what scares me about reaching out and posting is the potential for censorship. Um, mm. So is is the Twitter game pay to win now <laughs> nowadays? Mm -hmm. um, you you have to pay somebody in order to get your content promoted at the top. Um, how do you start promoting your your work on Instagram or YouTube if everything is being overran by people who have a significant <laughs> uh, budget in comparison to yours. Um, and on Facebook, there may be some content that you create that you can't actually even post um, due to rules and uh, regulations that they might have. So the censorship is always um, growing and is a large fear for myself and um, mm -hmm. other illustrators alike, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that concern about who owns, uh, who owns the content I've created. Um, and what are the implications of, okay, how do I get this out given, um, you know, if you don't have a large firm behind you, for example. So it's still a, there's still a pay to play element, it sounds like. For sure. Yeah. You, you guys are both, um, you're kind of hitting on two extremes we actually have in the game industry. It's just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, for digital distribution, you almost never buy a game in a store anymore. You know, you go to the internet and get it. Mm -hmm. And if you're on the PC side, you're essentially looking at Steam as almost a monopoly. Mm -hmm. uh, not completely, but near enough. Mm -hmm. And there's been some, some um, complaints lately about them not disallowing people to sell things on their site for whatever mm -hmm. reasons. So it's not an ownership issue, but it's, a, it's an access thing. Mm -hmm. um, if most people have PCs get their games through Steam, they're not ever gonna see that game. Mm -hmm. And if you go to mobile, which is what people do, is they get away from that. Mm -hmm. Now you have the opposite problem. Now you have too much. You 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 have I don't know how many thousands of games released every day, you know, on Android. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. But if you can get yours promoted, then mm -hmm. people will see it, right? Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. there's anything nefarious there. It's just there's just so much of it. Only you can only see so much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, how, how do you find a new game? So we mm -hmm. have a, a lot of our students actually creating games here mm -hmm. and put them on on the store and they get you know five downloads or something mm -hmm. and they're they're games that are really just as high quality as some of the ones that are very popular but nobody knows about it mm -hmm. and so we haven't actually solved that problem you know how do you find things you might be interested in mm -hmm. uh, they try to do that by looking at games like you play mm -hmm. uh, but that depends on those algorithms being reasonable and tags being right and that sort of thing so mm -hmm. anyway mm -hmm. it's and you still don't know if it's a good quality game or not, so mm -hmm. nobody's mm -hmm. reviewed it. So it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's just been flooded. But, so that's, that's, but that's why people go to mobile now, because it didn't cost anything. They just throw it out real fast, and Steam may block you. Right? I see. OK, so it sounds like there's, there really are these two extremes, then, of either um, concerns about um, almost a monopolistic control of a particular release avenue. And then um, so it's either that or the Wild West. It doesn't sound like there's a lot yes. of in-between, depending on what content you're trying that's to work exactly with. That's exactly right. We don't really have a good middle. OK. Any commentary from? Yes. Um, another thing um, is that um, I was just thinking 
Um, and as soon as I have the mic, my mind goes blank. Um, it it's like on on social media, like everyone who like is like on social media and promoting their stuff. Since a lot of people expect not to pay for things, like everybody ends up basically being buskers, well, where they'll give the content and then say, "Hey, here's my tip jar," and it's like, so there's like artists and writers and stuff, and everybody is putting their content out for free and then and then asking for money, and I think that's just an interesting change. YouTube yeah, in also. our world, it's actually ad supported mostly, so that it is free. But then there are ads that run, right? So. And then there's the constant battle between ad blockers and things of okay, how are we? Yeah. Um, but you raise a good point, though. Of there is in some um, art forms and some media forms this thing of now where there's an expectation to continue to put out free content or cheap content, and hopefully you make a living off tips, um, and that's a lot to ask for. Um, particularly folks who have spent time and, and, and money on formal training uh, to then go out and basically donate their services and hope they get enough, enough tips. So it is a, it's a, hmm? Software. Right, uh, addressing, and that's a, I'm glad you actually mentioned the software licenses issue um, because as the technology gets more specialized and if you're gonna work in a particular field, there are certain tools that you just have to use. Mm -hmm. um, and if an individual doesn't have access to that, it's kind of like the pay to play point that Mika made of if you don't have the money to buy the tool or you don't have the money to promote your content, then however cool whatever you create is, it may not get out to an audience. That's, that's a good point. Okay, and we're running short on time, so I wanna to get to our last question. Um, and it kind of continues from our previous question here. And so again, thinking about this plethora of content that we now have access to, um, and that is increasingly diversified, and we're creating new, new art forms um, all the time, um, how do we engage with this stuff ethically? Um, thinking about how folks get paid for their work. Uh, what do we as, as consumers or audience members, do we have any obligations to the content creators that their content that we take? And what do creators, if anything, owe to their audience members? in this climate? That's a big question. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Um, for me, personally, as a creator, I think we have a huge responsibility, um, ethically, to create meaningful work, sincere, earnest, meaningful, to know our topics, not just create things based on assumptions, but actually do research. Um, um, and, you know, we're asking, I always tell my students, you're asking people to give their life minutes to watching this. <laughs> Make it worthy, you know? Um, and I think that that's important. I also think as consumers, you know, kind of getting back to that idea of there's a lot of noise out there, I think the consumer's responsibility is to, to reach out a little bit, mm -hmm. go to film festivals instead of just, you know, <laughs> AMC or whatever, you know, <laughs> find out what, um, the, the new artists and the new folks are doing. So in the mm -hmm. film industry in particular right now is getting kind of um, beaten up because there's so many like Marvel films and they're just sort of recycling the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of filmmakers that are making really good stuff. So give the, get, kind of go off the beaten path, I guess, for consumers to, um, to search out where maybe some people are making stuff that is interesting. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, it really is, in a way, a kind of a golden age of content in a lot of ways. There's so much available. Whatever you're into, you can likely find something. Um, but expending that energy to go out outside the traditional channels uh, to try to, what, as audience members, maybe we can address some of that concern that Russ and Mika talked about of, um, you know, if stuff's not promoted, folks won't find it. Um, maybe that's on us a little bit to go into the weeds occasionally and see what we find there. Mika, did you have something you wanted to share? Uh, yeah. from. Again, from an advertising standpoint, um, you have to really get into a war with yourself. Sometimes um, the, the ethical repercussions of creating a specific type of content that you um, are hired to do, sometimes it might go against your moral standings. You know, um, At what point do you have to say, I'm not going to do that? Um, and you have to sometimes you know, think about whether that's the correct job for you or whether um, you will sacrifice it this once, but then 
it cascades into, well, what about the future? What if they ask for this again? You know, mm. things like that. But um, there, there have been a lot of situations that I've personally had to run into where I have questions like, um, is this something that I would be okay designing on my name rather than this, this company's name too? Mm -hmm. um, such as like taking stock or things like that and not supporting local artists. Sometimes that might have a little internal conflict with yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the ethical implications of advertising at the very least. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you sharing that, that I think um, the making that transition into a commercial setting and figuring out, okay, how do I, as an artist or content creator in this setting, still hold true to my own ethical standards? Um, and that's tough to do when you also need to pay rent, right? So figuring out how to balance those pieces. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll touch, I'll touch on both the consumer and uh, the creator, but uh, I'll start with the consumer. Yeah, on, on, a, on a consumer basis, I think, um, uh, something that's very important is both uh, community um, and sharing now nowadays, whether it be online or, or just um, by word of mouth. And that's something you know that we didn't really touch on earlier when we were talking about you know how do you uh, you know how do you get your piece of artwork or your game or whatever you're developing out in the world. Um, and, and, and going off of, you know, you talking about going to a, a small cinema or something like that, you know, it is actually places like, you know, Colab, you know, commu small communities that are sort of, you know, uh, sharing ideas and then hoping to bring in more people. Um, you know, nowadays when I'm, when I'm playing a new game or um, when I'm going to a, a, a film, Usually it's because of someone within one of my communities that's told me, hey, check this out. Um, and a lot of times it's not those advertisements that are really actually affecting me. Um, just because we're bombarded by so many of them, whether it be on Facebook where, you know, they have all these algorithms now that you're like, oh, well, you're looking at guitars earlier. So, hey, look, guitar strings or, you know, stuff like that, that you almost uh, ignore it. Uh, especially in a world where you know uh, cable TV isn't even uh, that popular as it used to be, so mm -hmm. people are watching uh, content on Netflix where there is not that sort of sense of advertisement that you got on uh, on cable. Mm -hmm. um, but as a creator, I think um, we have to uh, focus on interdisciplinary work. We have to get outside of our own field of study, whether it be art, computer science, um, ecology, whatever it is, um, because I think that's when those really great ideas happen and those meaningful th uh, moments happen is when you have cross-pollination of ideas between, uh, you know, um, within being, you know, being a student at a university right now, um, I think that's the most important thing actually is reaching out to other people, you know, reaching out, you know, as an artist, I reach out to people in the geosciences department or the computer engineering department. And I think that is actually uh, something that we owe to um, our audiences. Um, and that's the way we can get those sort of meaningful moments that, that you were talking about. So. Awesome. Thank you, Colin. And thank you also for the shout out to the collab. I, I promise I did not prearrange that. Um, but I think you raise a really good point because the so we kind of I think a lot of what we've talked about tonight um, it's kind of this double-edged sword of technology um, that it creates opportunities and obligations. Um, it makes it easier to find community, right? Um, you know, the d diversification of all the different interests and things you can go out and find uh, and connect through technology means you can find that community. But it also means it's easier to kind of limit your input. So. Um, uh, it sounds like that there's both an obligation for us to kind of get outside our comfort zones a little bit and think creatively about the uh, content that we're engaging with and maybe the content that we're creating. Um, we're into the last couple of minutes here, so I want to ask our audience if anybody else has a comment they would like to share. Okay, thank you. Any closing comments from our expert panel? Okay. Well, thank you everybody for being here. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you also especially to our expert panel for donating their time. Nobody was compensated to be here. This is all out of the kindness of their own hearts. So thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. And we hope you will join us next month where we'll be looking at the evolving workplace, specifically telecommuting and co-working spaces. That'll be on December 6th right here in the CoLab. Thank you everybody for being here tonight.